When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who, when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith, declared, I could not be shaken. So turn the page and look at chapter 13 of Acts and watch the first missionary journey of Paul unfold. It's incredible. Hold on to everything we learned in the first half, but now move into the second and look at verse 1, 2, and 3, and we will see the church already expanding and extending its borders. How's this for a cast of characters? Chapter 13, verse 1, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers. Now we already met a prophet, Agabus, but he's not alone in that calling. There are others with the gift of prophecy, others that have the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy. They're prophets, they're teachers, and here's a few. As Barnabas, who we've met several times already, and Simeon that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Now, interesting cast of characters here. We know Barnabas, we know Saul, but these others in the middle, Simeon called Niger. Now, Niger is the Latin word for black. And so some have wondered if Simeon Niger, some call him Simon Niger, was a black African, which would be beautiful to just see this spectrum within the church of Jesus Christ. Some, in fact, the fact that Simon called Niger is linked with Lucius of Cyrene. Some have wondered if Simon is also of Cyrene, just like Lucius was, which has led some commentators to suggest, could this be Simon the Cyrenian? It was the, man, the Simon that we met in the Gospels that carried the cross of Jesus, is that, is that Simon Niger? Perhaps, could be. Someone from North Africa that had come from Cyrene up to Jerusalem during the Passover feast. The other name that's interesting is Menaean because it mentions, we don't know anything about him other than he was brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. Hmm, is this a man with political connections? Did he have to sever those connections when he became a Christian? Was he still trying to have some kind of link where he knows what's going on in, in, among the powers that be? Was there a self-sacrifice on his part? It's so much that we don't know about these men, but we do know their faithfulness. In fact, the next verse says, As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Oh, there's strength here among these prophets and teachers. There's power and authority here among Simeon and Lucius and Menaean. They're fasting for each other. The Spirit comes and says, I need Barnabas and Saul. Separate them to me. Interesting. To separate means to set apart. That's the language we use. Set apart and separate was the language of Numbers chapter 6. Remember that chapter about the Nazarite vow? That people setting themselves apart, separating themselves from the rest of Israel, living higher standards to perform higher callings for the Lord. Well, the Lord is designating, you're all prophets and teachers, you're all wonderful souls. Some of you need to stay here and keep the work going in Antioch. But you, Barnabas and Saul, follow me. I have a foreign mission for you to perform. And so they go. Verse 4 and 5, So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia. And that's a port city west of Antioch. If you're going to start sailing somewhere, you'll go from Antioch to the coast. And Seleucia is where you'll end up. From thence, they sailed to Cyprus. And Cyprus is an island in the northeast corner of the Mediterranean Sea. So there's, this is the first time we see a, a ship voyage uh, for missionary work. And when they were at Salamis, and that's a city on the east coast of the island of Cyprus, 
What do they do once they get there? They preach the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had also John to their minister. John Mark, that is. Now, like I said, this is Paul's first missionary journey, and thus it begins. Heading down to the coast, getting on a boat, crossing to an island, continuing to preach the gospel there. But notice where he's doing it? At a synagogue of the Jews? Wait a minute, hadn't Peter had the vision? Wasn't Cornelius already baptized? Weren't other people already coming into the kingdom? Yes. But also think about what, what Paul is used to. In fact, his name here is still Saul, which is a Jewish name, king of Israel. Well, he loves his people. He knows his background. And what better people to start sharing the gospel with than those who share that common background? I mean, how would you convince Gentiles that Jesus is the Christ when they don't even know what a Christ is? They haven't been expecting one. They haven't been raised with messianic prophecies. Yeah, we need to start with people who have the shared basis of understanding, and then we'll build on that from there and help them see the fulfillment of Judaism, your Judaism, is Christianity. And, that, and thus they would begin their work. Let's straight to the synagogue and start preaching to Jews. It's actually interesting because in our day, if you compare the growth of the church in the Philippines and compare it to the growth of the church in places like Korea and Japan, it's all the same basic part of the world, right? It's Far East Asia, and yet the church has exploded in the Philippines compared to those other countries. And why? Well, I don't know all the reasons, but the fact that Catholicism had established Christianity throughout the Philippines in ways that it was not able to do in Korea or Japan what did Latter-day Saint missionaries find when they got to the Philistine, the, when they got to the Philippines? A shared understanding of Christianity. And they weren't trying to build Christianity upon the basis of Buddhism or Confucianism. That's possible, it's, but it's hard. My brother-in-law served his mission in Cambodia, and that was a different experience. No Christian base. And so to have a Jewish base from which to build Christianity upon, that's what Paul is doing here. And thus begins his first mission. It will comprise chapter 13 and 14. Historically, it takes place from about AD 46 to 49. So this is a good solid long mission that he's out there. And he's going to places that have never had the gospel preached there before. Okay, virgin territory. Now, notice who he bumps up against first, though. When Peter was beginning to preach the gospel, he ran up against Simon the sorcerer. Well, when Philip did, and then, then Peter came along uh, right, right in, his, in his track. But you have this sorcerer that's trying to figure out, do I believe? Why do I believe? Is this the real thing? Do I want a piece of the action? We remember that story from last week. But this time, you meet another sorcerer here on the island of Cyprus. Verse 6 through 8, when they had gone through the isle unto Paphos, and that's a city on the southwest side of Cyprus. So they've been crossing the island, preaching the gospel all along the way. But here they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus. Interesting name. Bar means son, right? So son of Jesus? Hmm. Which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Now, pause here and see what we're up against. And here we have two people, Bar-Jesus, also known as Elymas. Elymas might come from a word that means uh, learned or wise, and he certainly wanted to come across that way to convince people to follow him. Here, as a sorcerer, he is trying to Oh, smoke and mirrors, and to convince people of his power. Remember, again, that was Simon the sorcerer from before. Surely this is the great power of God. Not just that he had it, he is it. And that's what this man's after. He certainly doesn't want this deputy to go follow the faith of Saul and Barnabas. No, I want him on my side. I mean, if we got a sorcerer and a deputy, is this church and state walking hand in hand? And the church wanting the power of the state to be able to do its own thing? 
Well, what's interesting about this is Elimus Bargesus, as we might call him, is a perfect example of a counterfeiter extraordinaire. He's a Jew, and that's, that is what Paul is looking for. He's a Jew himself as well. But well, sorcery is not exactly looked on fondly by Judaism. So he's already breaking his own laws. More than that, as a sorcerer, he would be guilty of counterfeit miracles. As a false prophet, well, yeah, there's a counterfeit prophet if you ever saw one. His name Bar Jesus, son of Jesus. Oh, he's a counterfeit Christ. Uh, he's no son of Jesus. He's no son of the covenant. Oh, no. And in fact, Paul's going to call him out for that in just a moment. But he's trying to keep the deputy on his side. Good thing the deputy is described as a prudent man. Because if he's prudent, prudence would demand that he have an open mind and an open heart and hear the stories before he passes premature judgment. Now, that's not what Elimus Bar-Jesus wants. He wants the judgment already passed. And don't listen to these people. He withstands them. He wants to turn away the deputy from the faith. Assuming that if he just has a chance to hear it, he'll probably join them and leave me. I mean, that, that's how you spot a counterfeit. You compare it to the real thing. Now, here's the real thing. Verse 9. Then Saul, who also is called Paul. And again, so understated, just like, oh yeah, we started calling them Christians there in Antioch. Oh yeah, Saul. We're going to start calling him Paul from now on. It doesn't even get its own sentence. It's just a parenthetical insertion. Oh yeah, we're going to call him Paul from here on out. That's huge. This is a change of name that represents a change of identity. I mean, a change as dramatic as what he experienced is deserving of that kind of newness. Saul is a Hebrew name, like I said. Paul is a, a Latin name. It actually means small, by the way. It means little, which would be in keeping with the humility Christ wants for his apostles. Peter wasn't getting a big head. Paul shouldn't either. He needed to remain little in his own sight. In fact, remember Saul? He got a big head, and the Lord, through Samuel, had to chastise him. When you were little in thine own sight, oh, Saul, you should have been a Paul too. Well, this Saul, we're going to solve that problem early on. And so now we're going to call him Paul. And what do we learn about him here? He is filled with the Holy Ghost. That describes him beautifully. Well, he set his eyes on his adversary, on Elimus Bar-Jesus. And setting his eyes, yeah, there's Paul quick to observe. There's Paul discerning. There's an eagle eye looking for marks of a counterfeit. And oh, he sees them and calls them out. He said, oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief. And those are fighting words. Subtlety is the word that would describe the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Subtlety, the Greek there, means deceit and guile and treachery. It literally means bait. So, <laughs> this Elimus Bar-Jesus is a counterfeit fisher of men. He's just sending out lures and bait to try to catch people in his own trap. Mischief also has <laughs> some interesting synonyms. It means craftiness. It means recklessness. It means cunning. So, while Paul is filled with the Holy Ghost, his counterpart is filled with subtlety and mischief. Keep reading. Paul says, thou child of the devil. Again, you're no bar Jesus. You're bar Lucifer. You're a child of the devil. Thou enemy of all righteousness. Wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And perversion is a good description of what Elymas was trying to do as well. So what will his consequence be now that the counterfeiter has been outed? Paul says, and now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee. And thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. I'll oh, talk about a perfect example of letting the punishment fit the crime. You have set yourself up as a light <laughs> so that all eyes on you. Well, now how about no eyes in you? And you'll have no light to see by you have been blinding people spiritually. Well, let's see how you like it when you are blinded, literally. You have been trying to guide people in the wrong direction. Well, you'll now be at the mercy of guides of your own. 
I hope you choose good ones. Interesting what he's dealing with here. As a sorcerer, it's all been smoke and mirrors. It's all been mists of darkness. We know that from Lehi's dream. And now he'll be walking through those mists, those mists himself. Well, verse 12, then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed. And can you blame him? Talk about a sign. But notice why he believed. It wasn't the sign. Luke says that he believed being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. And that's amazing. It wasn't Paul's power. It was his principles. It wasn't the deed. It was the doctrine. And that blew away this deputy. What Paul was teaching. Oh, yeah, yeah. He took away the sight of Elimus bar Jesus. Who cares? But he gave me sight like I've never had before. Remember how often in the Gospels, Jesus was, it was to said of Jesus that people were amazed at his doctrine. They were shocked that his doctrine was such that he taught as one having authority and not as the scribes. It was this doctrine that you could have faith and move mountains. This doctrine that you could repent and have your sins washed away. This doctrine that you could make a covenant relationship with God Almighty. And that he would give you a gift like none other in the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's astonishing doctrine. I pray we never take it for granted. If we're waiting for something more visible, perhaps we've already been struck blind and don't have eyes to see the evidence of God and His goodness all around us in the doctrine we've been taught. With that in mind, this stage of the mission is, is over. And time on the island of Cyprus has come to its, its close. We have a deputy now. We can leave him behind. And as someone in authority, he'll be in a position of influence to bless all those that, that are under his care. So where do we go next? Verse 13. Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. Now, can we pause the mission for just a moment and make sure we're on the same page as far as geography and our cast of characters is concerned. Because we're just starting this mission. I don't want to get lost early on. But we need to understand where they're going. To this point, Christianity has been a Jewish sect. And it's been basically centered in Jerusalem and Judea. But back in Acts 1, Jesus himself said, as the risen Lord, that's just the beginning. From there go to Samaria. And they do, a little bit to the north. From there go to the uttermost ends of the earth. And we seem to be moving in that direction. The Ethiopian eunuch, after all, went down south to continue the, to preach the gospel that he just learned from Philip. And other apostles are moving north. That's where you see Saul, Paul now, and Barnabas. Antioch, in fact, has become a major headquarters of the church. It's there that it's big enough and different enough from Judaism that they start calling them Christians, right? And Antioch is in Syria. Antioch, by the way, is the third biggest city in the Roman Empire at the time. Behind Rome and Alexandria lies Antioch. And Christianity is, is booming there. Now, from there, Paul's going to take his show on the road. And he goes to the coast and gets on a boat and gets to an island, covers the island, preaches the gospel on the way, then north, and now comes to this place called Perga in Pamphylia. Sorry for all the P words. Now, don't worry, there's no map quiz at the end of today's lesson. But to get a sense of where we are, this uh, Pamphylia is a region in South Central Asia Minor. Now, Asia Minor? What, was there an Asia, Asia Major? Yes, <laughs> mainland Asia. And Asia Minor is this little piece of Asia that seems to poke out into Europe. Today we call it Turkey. If you think about it as an extension of Asia, it's north of the, the eastern edge of the Mediterranean Sea. It kind of pokes out over the Mediterranean and under the Black Sea. That's why it kind of looks like a peninsula almost. It's Asia sticking out. It's minor. It's Asia minor. Okay. Now, there. this is going to be an, a really important place throughout the rest of New Testament history because Paul's going to spend a lot of time in Asia minor on his mission. Many of his letters are going to be written to branches of the church in Asia minor. When 
John writes his revelation, it's to churches that are in Asia Minor. Okay, a lot of things that are happening here. Keep going west from there, and you get the Aegean Sea, and then it's Greece with Corinth and Athens and so on. Keep going beyond that, and you get the Adriatic Sea, and then there's Italy with Rome and some more of Christian history there. We're working our way around the Mediterranean. Some things have covered the south. We have people in Cyrene, for example, but now we're going around the north, and Paul's really going to head, head up the mission along those lines. So Pamphylia is this region. Perga is a city within that region. And it's on the south edge, about halfway, uh, kind of east to west, in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. So we got our geography down. And then as far as our cast of characters is concerned, Paul, present and accounted for. Barnabas, right-hand man. But John, as in John Mark, departs from them and goes back to Jerusalem. Now, we have no, no, we have no knowledge as to the reason why. Uh, and we have to be careful about judging him, therefore. Though Paul kind of passes judgment on him. Later we will see when Paul starts his second missionary journey, he doesn't want Mark to come with him. It's like, nope, you ditched out early on the first mission, and I'm afraid you'll do it again on the second, so I don't want you to come. Now that seems a little harsh of Paul. And Paul was a lot like Peter in terms of, you know, a pulpit pounder and I'm brash and ready to, I'm bold and sometimes overbearing. We'll wrestle with that when we see some of that evidence in his epistles. But he doesn't, this, cause, this is a source of friction between Paul and Mark. Now, I want to stop here though and speak to anyone out there whose ears perked up when they found out that an early Christian missionary, quote-unquote, went home early. I think there's a, a chance for application and relevance here that I hope will help those that might feel less than a full return missionary. Because for whatever reason, and again, we don't know Mark's, but for whatever reason, their mission didn't last as long as they had initially intended it to. Please do not think of yourself as a second-class citizen. Do not think of yourself as less than an RM. Elder Holland gave an amazing message to people in that exact situation and said, there's no asterisk on your, on your membership record. You're no less of a return missionary than anyone else. The church itself has wrestled with how long should missions be. 18 months? 24 months? 30 months? Uh, it keeps, keeps changing. And if yours was longer or shorter than others, quit comparing. And certainly don't compare yourself and look down upon yourself. This is a lesson Paul's going to need to learn. And he does. Because later in some of his epistles, he speaks highly of Mark. And is so grateful for the ministry that Mark performs. Again, the Mark who wrote the gospel that other gospels were built on. The Mark that Peter wants right alongside every step of the way. A mark that is an incredible servant of the Lord, despite the fact he was an early return missionary the first time he went out. It was the first time he went out. It wasn't the, it wasn't the last. And to any of you that need to have a patron saint for early return missionaries, Mark's a pretty good one. Yes, you might be judged by some. Prove them wrong. Just like Paul did. That's why, again, it's like, Paul, why are you judging him? You got judged yourself. Your conversion was doubted. But you didn't take it personally. You just proved them wrong. Well, Mark, you can do the same. And he does. It's a beautiful thing. But back to our missionaries. When they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia. This is a different Antioch. It's a common name. This is one inland from Perga, Central Asia Minor. And what do they do to start their work there? They went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. Again, still seems like a very Jewish movement. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, which is what they did in synagogues on the Sabbath, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Which is amazing that they would let them speak. I mean, Elimus Bar-Jesus didn't want to give them a chance. 
but here are Jews. Do they not know that these quote-unquote fellow Jews are actually Jewish Christians? Maybe not. Then again, maybe they do, but these are foreigners. These are outsiders. They've come all the way into our city. Surely they have a message, and we're open to hear it. I love that openness. I love their willingness to suspend judgment. Maybe they're just as prudent as the deputy was. And if you have words of exhortation for us, if there's things that you outsiders can bring into us, if you've seen things we haven't seen, then we're all ears. Please enlighten us. And they do. Verse 16 then, Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand said, Men of Israel, and ye that fear God, those are those God-fearers that we first talked about when we met Cornelius, outsiders that are acting like insiders and wish they could be. So, Israelites, God-fearers, give audience. Oh, Paul wants their undivided attention. He's standing, he's beckoning, he's telling them, lend me your ears, friends, Romans, countrymen. The God of this people of Israel chose our fathers. Here's Paul the Jew clearly identifying himself with his audience. This people, it's Israel, it's our fathers. I'm on your side. But the God of Israel exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with an high arm brought he them out of it. And about the time of forty years suffered he their manners in the wilderness. Amazing way to say that, by the way. He suffered their manners, or lack thereof. Oh yeah, all the murmur, murmur, murmur that went on, all the stuff that Moses had to deal with, well, all the stuff that God had to deal with. Now what the beginning of the history lesson? Now it's going to be a lot shorter than Stephen's, but he is trying to establish Israelite history, his own Israelite identity, and help move people from that past to this glorious present in Christ. Fulfillment of all that they've been preparing for. So he continues, verse 19, When he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, this is now the conquest of the promised land, he divided their land to them by lot. And after that, he gave unto them judges about the space of 450 years, until Samuel the prophet. And afterward they desired a king, and God gave unto them Saul, I know the name pretty well, the son of Kis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, by the space of 40 years. Now, he's flying through Israelite history. Again, not going into detail like Stephen did, but in some ways he's hinting, what kind of a leader were you looking for? We had judges, we've had prophets, we've had kings. Which do you prefer? And when he, God, had removed him, Saul, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom all he gave their testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart which shall fulfill all my will. Of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. Now, how's that for a sharp turn from Judaism to Christianity? He went from Saul to David to Jesus. Oh, a lot faster than Stephen did. But he's trying to cut to the chase. Jesus, after all, is the son of David. He is the king of kings. He is the restorer of the divinic monarchy. And you of the house of Israel need to know who your king is, who your prophet is, who your judge is. Take your pick. Jesus is all of the above. He's trying to help prepare them for that transition from Judaism to Christianity. He does it again in verse 24. When John, the Baptist that is, had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and as John fulfilled his word, he said, Who is he that I am? I am not he. But behold, there cometh one after me, whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to loose. So let's build on John the Baptist's mission, and not just David's. David looked forward to some fulfillment. John the Baptist did as well. And who were they both thinking of? Jesus. You accepted John the Baptist. Will you accept the one that John was pointing toward and preparing people for? Verse 26, Men and brethren of the stock of Abraham, and whoever among you feareth God, you God fears too, listen up, to you is the word of this salvation sent. The word of this salvation Remember, Jesus is the Word 
made flesh. And the name Jesus means salvation. So he is the word of this salvation. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, this is the light shining in darkness and the darkness comprehending it not, they didn't get it. They didn't see that light. Nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, just like you've been doing today in the synagogue. They didn't see the light. They didn't hear the voice of the prophets. They didn't get it. And as a result, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired they, Pilate, that he should be slain. And so he was. Now, the irony in all of that is what Paul just said. They wouldn't heed the voice of the prophets, but they ended up fulfilling their words. They wouldn't listen when the prophets said, this is Christ. Instead, they fulfilled the messianic prophecies describing his death, his rejection, and eventually his resurrection. In some ways, this reminds me of the mission field when you'd meet people that would say, oh, no, no, I don't believe in the Book of Mormon because I already have a Bible. I'm like, oh, well, you don't believe in the Book of Mormon, but you just quoted it. And in fact, though you don't believe it's prophetic, you just proved that it is because you fulfilled one of its prophecies. Look right here in 2 Nephi 29. And isn't that basically what you just said? Yeah, they knew you would. In a similar vein, what's happening here, you just fulfilled the words of prophets that you didn't believe because they bore witness of Christ and you wouldn't believe in Christ. Instead, you crucified him. But, verse 29, when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead. And he was seen many days of them which came up from him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. This first discussion from Paul has a star striking resemblance to the first discussion from Peter. Peter spoke of the crucifixion and the resurrection, bore solemn personal witness of it, and now Paul is doing the same. Stephen had done likewise. He taught the history of the crucifixion. He then gave a, an amazing witness of the resurrection in seeing Christ on the right hand of God in the very moment of his martyrdom. How's that for a witness of the resurrection? His dying words. And now it's Paul's turn. Paul who saw the Lord on the road to Damascus. Paul who was a witness of the resurrection himself. Oh, no wonder his, his discussion, his, his witness is so much like Peter's. Verse 32 then, we declare unto you glad tidings. And isn't that what the gospel means? The good news? These are the glad tidings of great joy that shall be unto all people. How that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children. And that he hath raised up Jesus again. As it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Now, Paul, are you, you showing off here? Maybe a little? Well, no, not for his sake. But man, he knows his scriptures. He's a Jew trained by Gamaliel, him, Gamaliel himself. And, and yeah, he knows the word of God. So he quotes the second psalm and says that, right? Second psalm, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And Jesus is that begotten son of God, only begotten in the And then when he talks about the sure mercies of David, he doesn't tip his hat to the reference, but that's Isaiah chapter 55, verse 3. The sure mercies of David, and that's restoration of the Davidic monarchy. That's resurrection from the dead. I mean, David will see corruption, but the son of David won't. David was in the tomb and his body decomposed, but Jesus was only in the tomb from Friday to Sunday. He rose triumphant. No corruption there. And all of this in service of what? Promise he made with the fathers. The fathers. This almost has a Malachi feel together, weaving these strands of scripture from the Psalm, Isaiah, hints of Malachi, all to bear witness of Jesus Christ. 
And the Malachi verse is speaking of the promises made to the fathers, being planted in the hearts of the children so that hearts and tie together this family tree. The fathers, the patriarchs, that's Isaac, Jacob. That's house of Israel. That's seed of Abraham. And the Abrahamic covenant, which was made first to you, was in order to bless all the of the earth. It's happening. It's go time. And here we are preaching to you Jews first but chomping at the bit to preach to the Gentiles too. There is so much in what Paul is preaching here. That's the glad tidings, if I've ever seen it. Now, verse 35, Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, and this one's going to be Psalm 16, verse 10, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption, which is what he just talked about in the previous verse. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. That was that decaying in the grave I just mentioned. But he is up, even he saw no corruption. So as much as you love King David, Jesus is the King of Kings. He far outranks mighty David. In fact, David was looking forward to Jesus. David died in hopes, and Jesus came to fulfill those hopes. He's fulfilled all our hopes, too. Verse 38, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, Jesus, that is, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Now, that is a hinge point in Paul's preaching. To this point, it's been Judaism, Judaism, rah, rah, rah. it's been house of Israel and God in our lives and all these things that have happened. And we're the recipients of the covenant and we're the stock of Abraham. And look at all the promises God has made to us. But what did he say about the law of Moses? We can't be justified by the law of Moses. We just can't. I'm sorry, guys. You know that. As much as we pray, preach and pray about Moses, and I know it's not just lip service that we're giving it, but we can't perfectly. Can I get an amen? I mean, think about all the, all the bad manners that God had to deal with among our ancestors in the wilderness. I don't know how much our manners have improved since then. Oh, we are not justified. We're not made straight. The law keeps telling us how far we've fallen from it. The law is this perfect level. We lay it up against us and see how, how far downhill we've slid. The, the, the law is our perfect square, and we don't measure up to it. We cannot be justified by it. So our hope of justification. Paul will preach this so many times to so many people in all of his letters. But here we see this hint, <laughs> first time he lands in Asia Minor. And he's, he's trying to cut to the chase here. It's justification through faith in Christ, not through our obedience to law, because our obedience isn't perfect. Our only hope is in Christ. So verse 40, Beware, therefore, lest that come upon you, which is spoken of in the prophets. And here he's going to quote Habakkuk, chapter 1, verse 5. I told you he knew his scriptures. Here's Habakkuk for you. Behold, ye despisers, and wonder, and perish. For I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. And Paul could say, and I'm that man. Here I am, declaring God's marvelous work and wonder to you. So what do you think? Will you despise and wonder and perish? Or will you beware of that tendency and choose to believe? I, I know I made a big jump from Israelite history to fulfillment in Christ. I know I just said some fighting words about the law of Moses. But this is God's marvelous work and wonder. 
It is marvelous. It's a head scratcher. It's resurrection after crucifixion. It is fulfillment of all these messianic prophecies, even while we remain under the Roman yoke. I know it's not what I expected. Believe me, I was fighting against it, just like you might be tempted to do. But beware. And let Habakkuk hiss from that and warn you not to despise something that seems too good to be true. Please believe me. I'm declaring it unto you. And I'm a personal witness. Now, there's no news about their reaction, at least not yet. But turn to verse 42. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, probably the whole way, the Gentiles be that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. I mean, they're assuming this must be a Jewish thing. And here we are, Gentiles, we're not invited in. But if these guys come around each Sabbath to preach, then can we have dibs on the next one? I mean, we heard some something talk about justification outside the law of Moses. Oh, yeah, that perked up our ears. Is that even possible? What, what did you mean by that? Will you preach to us? Now, when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes, and a proselyte is a convert, they followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And I love that patience on their part. You don't have to take our word for it. Just continue in the grace of God. Think about what we've said. Take some time and ponder. If you're wondering within yourselves, that's okay. Peter himself was doing that after his vision of the sheet and the unclean animals. But he came to himself. I believe you will too. If you'll ponder, if you'll wrestle with these things, if you'll consider the and the witness I just gave of the resurrected Christ, oh, I pray you'll have eyes to see and see truth before you. Verse 44, sure enough, the next Sabbath day came. And when it did, came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. Can you picture the multitudes just packing in, wanting to, to hear what Paul had to say. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Oh, blaspheming? It doesn't sound like they were accusing Paul and Barnabas of blasphemy. They were the ones blaspheming. Now, I doubt they would be blaspheming God unless they're saying things about God that just aren't true like God has confined himself only to the house of Israel, like God demands perfect obedience to the law of Moses because there's no other way to be justified. Well, maybe there is some blasphemy there. Then again, blasphemy also refers not just to God, but to God's servants. And they're definitely blaspheming Paul and Barnabas. Okay. Now, what, how, are the, how, is, how are the people going to respond? Uh, you definitely have some people opposed to this preaching now. You basically have a multitude of Elymas Bargesuses that are trying to turn away the deputy. Okay, the opposition will come anytime you, you preach the truth. But notice what it was motivated by. The word was envy. They were filled with envy. And that's typically what lies at the root of opposition. It's why persecution grows when a church grows. Because why are they growing? And are they just taking from our members? Are they sheep stealing? That was a verb I learned in the South. And it made sense why evangelical Christians wouldn't like Latter-day Saint missionaries. Now, there's envy there. Their growth is coming at our expense. But that does beg the question, is religion a zero-sum game? Where for one to get ahead, someone else has to fall behind? Or can faith be a rising tide that lifts all boats? Can this be a blessing to everyone? Like that wonderful Southern Baptist couple that lived down my street. You understand that it, we can work together, we can maintain our differences, we can agree to disagree without becoming disagreeable. There doesn't need to be envy here. Let's allow God to do His work, His marvelous work and His wonder. Well, verse 46, then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold as if they hadn't been bold before. <laughs> they're, they're getting bolder by the minute. The anger of the Jews hadn't frightened them at all. It only added fuel to their fire. And so boldly they said, it's not necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you 
and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, and now he quotes Isaiah 49, verse 6, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And with that statement, that mic drop, there's another hinge point in Christian history. Paul just said it perfectly. God chose you first, intending you to choose everyone else. In fact, the full version of the verse in Isaiah that he just quoted hints at that. He speaks about gathering Israel, but then Isaiah says, but if you think Israel was a big deal, it's just the first step. The were gathered Israel, then to go and gather all people into Israel. That's the real mission of this chosen people. Why can't you be chosen in the right way? Like I said before, the moment you stop choosing others is the moment God stops choosing you. And if you don't choose God, then how can God choose you at all? Will you choose Christ, our King, our Messiah who has come among us? Or do you judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life? That's such an interesting phrase. Do you not think you're deserving of this? It's one thing to succumb to pride and think, oh no, Jesus is beneath us. But to succumb to some false sense of humility, thinking that, I mean, it's so fascinating what Paul is accusing them of. You, it's like you don't want to be Israel. You don't want to live up to who you really are, that divine identity. You don't want to share the gospel. You don't want to go out and serve. You don't want to gather yourselves. You don't want to be gathered into, into the covenant and then go gather everyone else. Why don't you think God would want you? Has our history been so full of persecution that it, it's made you think you deserve that instead of deserving something better? Are you so used to being kicked around by Assyria and Babylon and Greece and Rome that you don't realize that God has simply been preparing you scattering you in order to speed the gathering. You're worth it. You're worth the love of God. You're worth the blood of Christ. You're worth second chances and hundred chances. You're worth it to have repentance granted unto you. Yes, I'm speaking to you, whoever you are that feels that you're unworthy of God's mercy. To you who judge yourselves undeserving of the Savior's grace. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter who you think you've become. God is turning to you. So please turn back to him. Otherwise, we'll have to turn to people that are open to this message. That's what Paul did. We turn to the Gentiles. This is the moment. He'll still preach in Jewish, uh, Jewish synagogues. He'll still try to reach out to the Jews. But from here on out, the pendulum has swung and we're going to become a Gentile church, like it or not. The day of the Gentiles will be ushered in. And it will stay that way until the restoration and the last days when the first shall then be last and the last shall be first. But the day of the Gentiles will be fulfilled and God will try again with his covenant people. They're still his covenant people. You understand all of this historically, but do you also understand all of this personally? This verse made me think of Nelson Mandela's fav famous phrase from his inaugural address in 1994, where he famously said, Our deepest fear is not that we are in. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. You are a child of God. Your playing small doesn't serve the world. Oh, that's powerful. I wonder if Paul would say similar things to these Jews. Don't play small. Don't consider yourselves unworthy of the grace of God. Don't, let your, don't keep beating yourselves up with the law of Moses as your, as your club, as your slave. Paul is your master to come unto Christ. It means you that there should be a better day 
because you keep falling short. And who is he that can lift you up? Only Jesus. You're worthy of that. Your unworthiness is what requires Christ to come to you. Your unworthiness proves your worthiness of you need it. That's why he came. Okay. Now, verse 48 and 49, we're nearing the end of this chapter. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad. I mean, the Jews are up in arms, but the Gentiles are stoked because what? He's going to turn to us now. We don't have to wait for another Sabbath. Every day can be our Sabbath. He's going to come. They were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. Oh, the gospel is spreading. This word of mouth, this Gentiles telling fellow Gentiles, this is glad people sharing the glad tidings of great joy. Extra, extra, read all about it. It's our turn. It's as if everyone just had the vision that Peter and Cornelius shared several chapters before. Now, please don't read predestination into what we just read. It sounds like that. I can see where John Calvin would come up with some of this, but it's, it's incorrect. The way it's phrased there, as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Oh, those are the ones that God had already decided to save, and they're the ones that believed? No, no, no. Salvation is self-selected as we respond positively to the invitation to come into Christ. And so, Joseph Smith in the JST flips around the order of words and clarifies the doctrine. The King James says, as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. The JST says, as many as believed were ordained unto eternal life. That teaching the word order there makes all the difference. It's belief that determines our ordination of eternal life. It's not some kind of predestination that determines whether or not we'll believe. We really do have agency. They really are choosing. And these Gentiles chose wisely and believed. But others chose poorly. And verse 50, But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. Get them out. Get them out of town. And who's doing it? Who's getting stirred up by the unbelieving Jews? Devout people, honorable people, people that would have made such a difference in the kingdom of God, both women and men. Too often it's Satan's goal to get, keep people tied to lesser light, even though it's light, as long as it keeps them from the, the fullness of that light. To stir them up, to get them up in arms, to make them more devout to Judaism than they'd, than they'd ever been before. Chief men that could have made such a difference. But no, they kicked out Barnabas and Paul, and how do they react? They shook off the dust of their feet against them and came unto Iconium. That's another inland city in Asia Minor, the southeast of Antioch of Pisidia that we saw a little bit ago. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost, despite being expelled, despite being persecuted. No, they'd left their mark in that area. They had preached the gospel and people had accepted. Yes, others had rejected. Of course that's going to happen. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of the sun. It's a sharp two sword and it cuts, divides asunder. Bears and sheep from goats and foolish from wise. Believers from non-believers. But we've given them the opportunity to choose. And they are choosing. With that, we then turn to chapter 14. And here we will see their mission continue. And we'll see them up against both praise and persecution. We've already seen that there with Jews and Gentiles and how they respond to Paul's first discussion. But it's going to be even more dramatic in chapter 14. And especially to those that oh, are exposed to public opinion, however big or small, how your students think of you and how your neighbors think of you and what your friends, how they respond to you, both praise and persecution can be problematic. We're going to see that spelled out here.
So chapter 14, verse 1 and 2. And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews. Now, didn't we just say they'd turn to the Gentiles? Well, yes, but the norm is still to approach the Jews first. Tradition is hard to change, after all. And again, Jews are set up for this. They're, they're made for conversion because we're, we're fulfilling all of their messianic hopes. So again, let's start there, but we can quickly turn to the Gentiles if need be. Now, they so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. So great news. But where there's believers, there's also unbelievers. And sure enough, the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. So you have these unbelievers stirring up others. And interesting phrase, making their minds evil affected. Planting seeds of doubt to crowd out any seeds of faith that the apostles might be planting. So often, when the gospel finds oh, clear soil, those seeds take root and grow. So often, when there are not preconceived notions, and someone is, has an open mind and an open heart and gives the gospel a chance, it's amazing how, how quickly testimony can grow. No wonder the adversary is so intent on affecting minds to evilly. Is that a word? Uh, there's a word that Joseph Smith used in Joseph Smith history, that the reason he wrote his, his own story was to disabuse the public mind. Fascinating verb. If, a, if the public mind needs to be disabused, then what had already happened to it? It had been abused. It had been evil affected. And people thought they knew Joseph Smith's story when they didn't. People thought they knew what Paul had come to preach, but they were wrong. We, there's a lot of unlearning that has to take place before people can learn. And sometimes it's a matter of what do you think you know, and then we'll help you learn from there. That's something Paul's going to have to work on. Now, verse 3 and 4, long time, therefore... So be patient. Changing preconceived notions is going to take a while. Long time, therefore, abode they, speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. I love the patient approach here. Let's abide. Let's stay. Let's keep speaking boldly. Let's keep giving testimony. The word of God's grace is what will soften hearts and change minds. The signs and wonders that we will give can be evidence of that faith. But the multitude of the city was divided, and part held with the Jews, and part with the apostles. Again, it's that two-edged sword I mentioned before. Sheep and goats and wheat and tares. But the Lord is giving them time to decide. Will you join the apostles or play the part of their persecutors? Jews and Gentiles, believers and non-believers, which side will you be on? Now, verse 5 to 7 intensifies things. Because when there was an assault made, both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews, with their rulers, to use them despitefully and to stone them, they were aware of it, and fled unto Lystra and to Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and unto the region that lieth round about. And Lystra, or Lystra, is south of Iconium. Its Derby is even further east of that. So what's happening? They're spreading. Sure enough, last phrase, there they preached the gospel. So try as you might, you're not ending things. You're just extending things. You're pushing them down the, the row, and that's where they wanted to go eventually anyway. But it is interesting to see this intensification of the opposition. It's not just wars of words and tumult of opinions. It's... It's sticks and stones and breaking bones. It is assault and stoning they're talking about here. Wanting to create more martyrs to the faith? Stephen wasn't enough. James wasn't sufficient. No, we want to end things for Barnabas and Paul. But no, they won't be ended. Instead, they just move on, go forward, flee one place just to go build faith in another. That can't be stopped. Now, verse 8 through 10, we'll see what happens next now that they're in Lystra. 
They'll meet someone that needs them in a different kind of way. There sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb who never had walked. And we seem to be meeting a lot of those in the book of Acts. We met a few in the Gospels, but here we've seen Peter and John raise the lame man on the steps of the temple. We saw Peter raise Aeneas to his newly strengthened feet. Well, this man, probably hoping for a similar miracle, his entire life has been spent without the ability to stand on his own two feet. Well, that's about to change, because the same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him, that's Paul looking at him steadfastly, and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, stand upright on thy feet, and he leaped and walked just like the man from the Temple Mount. Oh, whenever faith to be healed, which is what Paul recognized in this impotent man, meets faith to heal, which Paul had himself, then look out, miracles are about to take place. Paul had that faith because he spoke in a loud voice, uh, loud enough for all to hear, loud enough for people to call him out if this didn't work. It's the same volume that Jesus used when he called Lazarus to come forth from the grave. There was no shyness, no hesitation there. And again, for Paul to recognize in this hearer, you want to stand, but more than that, you believe you can. Now that I am preaching of Christ, who performed those kinds of miracles, who can conquer death, let alone the affliction you've been suffering with, Oh, to stand, to walk, to leap. What's the message here? If you can't stand on your own two spiritual feet, have the faith to change. If you lack direction and momentum, you cannot move forward on the path, then have the faith to be healed. And come listen to a prophet's voice and let them raise you off the ground to a higher level of living. Have them move you forward along the covenant path. I feel strengthened in my feet every time I listen to President Nelson. Now, the people are going to react to this in one way or another. We've seen dual reactions in the past. Some believe, some don't. Some side with the Jews, others side with What's going to happen here? Verse 11, When the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lyconia, The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Jupiter, and Paul Mercurius, because he was the chief speaker. Remember, in the Roman pantheon, Jupiter is the, the chief god. Does that suggest Barnabas seems to be calling the shots here? Or Paul is Mercury. Mercury is the messenger of the gods. And that seems to be what Paul's doing, speaking on behalf of divinity itself. Now, that's the Roman pantheon. If this were the Greek pantheon, it would be Zeus and Hermes. Either way, they are trying to deify these men. Because who could possibly give strength to a man born lame? Oh, this must be a, the gods have descended to be among us. In fact, more than just giving them these divine names, notice the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands unto the gates, and would have done sacrifice with the people. I mean, imagine that. They are ready to offer animals by way of sacrifice to these mere mortals that they consider gods having come down to earth. Hmm, will this go to the apostle's head? That's the question. That's the hope of their enemies, right? The hope of the adversary who succumbed to pride himself. It's so interesting that the adversary never gives up. He just retreats and regroups and then retries. And in this case, he's swung the pendulum from persecution to praise, knowing that either one is problematic. This is the pride cycle, which we've studied so many times in the Book of Mormon and in the Old Testament last year, that since I couldn't keep them in the realm of destruction, fine, let them get past destruction onto prosperity. Because prosperity always tends to lead to pride, which then comes to destruction again all over. It doesn't matter. If we, can, if we can get them thinking that they're gods, lowercase g, then that will remove them from the power of God, capital G. 
They'll be on their own, trusting in their own strength, which is sadly insufficient, and that's fine by us. Oh, the adversary is a cunning, crafty one, isn't he? Remember what Brigham Young had said once? That well, as the saints were beginning to settle in the Salt Lake Valley and begin to spread and get to the point where they might actually survive, Brother Brigham said in his, his inimitable way, I am afraid of the third of the three Ps. The first P we endured was persecution. We came out stronger as a result. We then had to suffer poverty, but we came out on the, of that as well. The P I'm most worried about is the P of prosperity. And then Brigham's language, because here I'm afraid we will grow rich in these valleys of the West. And as a result, we will wax fat, kick ourselves out of the church and go to hell. How's that for Brother Brigham? Well, we seem to be in the process of that. Uh, are we waxing fat? Well, guilty as charged. Are we kicking ourselves out of the church? Well, not even kicking. We're just leaving. And so much of that is based on our own pride, born of our own prosperity. I don't need God. I'm fine without him. And if they can get Paul and Barnabas to really start thinking that they really might be Jupiter and Mercury, then all the better. We'll take them down a few notches by lifting them to heaven. If only they'll succumb to it. Now, we already saw Herod succumb to it, and it cost him his life. Will it cost these apostles their spiritual life? Peter would stand up against this, no problem. Why are you looking at me like I did some big thing? It only comes through Jesus. How will Barnabas and Paul respond? Notice verse 14. As this priest of Jupiter is on his way to offer sacrifice, which when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of, they rent their clothes. That's a symbol of mourning, of contrition, of godly sorrow. And they ran in among the people, crying out and saying, Sirs, why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you, and preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein. And that's not us. We didn't create any of these things. In fact, we didn't even heal the layman. I mean, sure, it was our hands and our voice and so on, but no, this only God can do that. And it's the real God, the, the living God. We are simply his servants. In fact, the title Luke gives them, we are simply his apostles. That's interesting. We haven't seen the time for the apostles to gather together to fill vacancies. There would have been another vacancy with the death of James, for example, but have they gotten together like we saw in, Luke, in uh, Acts chapter 1 to discuss and present names to the Lord for his decision? No, but here we see this title granted these men. We know in Saul's case, Paul's case, that he is a witness of the resurrection just like the others were. But as an apostle, we are simply sent by the Lord. We are not the Lord himself. We are, we are servants, not God, and we will not let your praises go to our head. I love that Paul is doing just what Peter would have done. Why are you looking at us? Like we had done some big thing. In fact, the way Paul says it is so profound. We're just like you. We are men of like passions, like personalities, like traits and weaknesses as well as strengths. We succumb to pride, though we're not doing it now. And we get caught up in emotion, kind of like you have done. But no, do not worship us. We're no different than you are. Even the way Paul asks them the question, why do ye these things? I think he's giving them a chance to really consider, why are you drawn to this cult of celebrity? For us, why do we care so much about stars and famous athletes and want their autograph and, and we follow them their every move? What is it about us that wants to worship mere mortals when we should be worshiping God and looking to Him for divine direction? Maybe Paul said it best when he spoke of these vanities, turn from them. And is it vanity on the part of the praised or vanity on the part of the praiser? 
And people wanted to be seen, but also wanted to be seen with those that are so seen. And, oh, I got to meet so-and-so, and look at that. And I've even wondered with famous people, at what point in your life did you forget that you're just like the rest of us? At what point did you think you, oh, walked above the earth and were at a position where you could look down on everyone else? No, you are like men of like passions like everybody else. We've got to remember that. Now, in verse 16, Paul will build on this and say some things that he will repeat more famously when he gets to Athens next week in chapter 17. Powerful statement. Verse 16, he says, Who in times past, he's still speaking of the living God, the God of glory, and he says, In times past, he suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. He, he kind of let them do their own thing. He let them learn by trial and error. He withheld condemnation. He just honored their agency and hoped they'd figure things out. Well, did they? That's the question. He suffered them to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. This is the God of creation, after all. And with that creation, he gave evidence that he existed. He gave us reason to improve ourselves. Would we take them or not? Well, that's up to us. Again, we're going to see this repeat in different language in Acts chapter 17, but keep this in mind. He let us do our own thing, but he let us know who he was. Well, now he's going to make things more obvious, and I'm here to bear witness of the living God. Now, is that going to be enough to calm them? Well, yes, but barely. The next verse says, With these sayings, scarce restrained they the people, that they had not done sacrifice unto them. They barely stopped the people from worshiping them like gods in the form of men. No, we're just men in the form of men. Not my, what, Don't look at us. Look heavenward. As I've pondered this, especially as a teacher, and I think too often, especially when you teach youth, Teenagers, oh, there's, there's fickle opinion for you. And they will love you one day and, and cast you out the next. Uh, I always joked with the early morning seminary teachers I trained in the South. that This, is call, this calling is relentless. You can have a life-changing morning one day, and the veil parts, and the angels sing, and the students just float off to school praising your name the whole way. And you still have to prepare a lesson for tomorrow. Because if it's boring, they're going to they're gonna destroy you. It's a tough one. And the, the interesting thing about teaching or leading is you're in a position of influence. And if, you, if you're any good at it, or if you keep it up and get better, then hopefully the good days will outnumber the bad. There'll be more praise than persecution. Uh, but we often seem ill-equipped to deal with praise. We let it go to our heads, and we start, breathe, we start inhaling, to quote Elder Uchtdorf. We start thinking that, oh yeah, maybe I am hot stuff. And that's the pride cycle's next step toward destruction. From Paul's example here, we've been talking about P's of persecution and praise. Can we introduce a few P's as far as how to diffuse those situations? Because what I love in the example of Paul here is first P Purify. Purify your motives. Make sure you're doing this for the right reasons. And I believe Paul is doing that through his entire ministry. The same Paul who remembers himself as Saul, who knows that repentance was granted to him, though undeserving on his own part. And so to purify the reasons we're doing things and making sure that we always have an eye single to the glory of God, that purification of our motives has to underlie everything else. The other two Ps come more directly from what Paul is doing here. The second P is to protest, which he does. He protests their exaggerated praise. D -d -d Don't do that. Now, in, for us, that doesn't mean denying every compliment. That can sometimes be false humility. Uh, and, and, that's, and that's not what the Lord is after. 
that might be meant then for the third P, which helps solve all the problems, and that is to point in the direction of the Savior. As long as my motives are pure, and they are purified, then when someone comes and says something nice to keep it from going to my head, I will protest any exaggeration on their part. I will I, I'm not going to shut them down because that's refusing a gift that they're offering you. Just a kind word of gratitude. But to, to sidestep some of that, that adoration and adulation, to point them to the real source of every good thing, to let them know, thank you for your kindness, but don't look at me. I'm just the server here. I didn't cook the, the food. I am merely a messenger, and it's God that has done the teaching, the leading, the blessing, the healing. May all the glory go to Him. If you consider this a gift, wonderful, then there's a giver, <laughs> and I'm just a receiver. And may the glory go to the giver of the gift. Purify, protest, and point, and hopefully we'll avoid succumbing to the sins of pride. We all need to work on it. It is a universal sin, after all. Next, in verse 19, notice what the apostles do. There came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium. Now, that's where they had last been preaching, okay? And these Jews come to this next city. They've been following the apostles everywhere they go. And they persuaded the people. And having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Man, the pendulum swung back quickly. They tried persecution to the point of stoning first, didn't work, they fled, got out of the way, now we tried praise, ooh, that didn't work, well, let's go back to our old bread and butter. Let's just persecute, let's just try to end things now. These people are so fickle, they're so easily swayed, and so are people in our day. No wonder we need to get our sense of self from God and not from others, because otherwise they'll, no, they'll crown you today and crucify you tomorrow. They'll... They'll shout, Hosanna, son of David, on Palm Sunday, and then shout, crucify him on Good Friday. But here, with Paul at the point of death, in fact, people supposing he had been dead, notice the next phrase, howbeit as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up. There's a little mini resurrection there, following the example of Christ. And he came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. So looking for greener pastures, seeking safer space, but nothing's going to stop the apostles. Here's Paul nursing his wounds, just like Peter and John had done when they left the prison, but just looking for their next opportunity to open their mouths and let them be filled. That happened in verse 21 with Paul. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch. Now, again, I told you there's not going to be some kind of geography lesson, and usually we just skip over place names like this, but don't skip these ones. Where did they go back to? To Iconium and Antioch. Now, go back a few verses and look at verse 19, and where did the Jews come from that persuaded the people to stone Paul? From Antioch and Iconium. And what amazes me here is here's Paul. He's not just retracing his steps to get back to the ocean to be able to head back home. No, he's going back to the exact places that his persecutors were from. Not just his persecutors, his near executioners. This is Daniel getting out of the lion's den and then turning around and getting right back in. Talk about fearlessness on the part of Paul. And what does he do when he gets there? This is amazing. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. And you think he had legs to stand on when he bore that witness? You think he could preach from personal experience, limping his way into town, bloodied and bruised, but unbowed, reassuring fellow saints that no doubt would face persecution of their own? Oh, talk about leading by example. Tribulation is how we come to know God. This is the same Paul that later will coin the phrase, the fellowship of his suffering. Suffering like Christ. 
though we never suffer quite to his extent, not even close. It does bring us into his fellowship. We come to know God in our extremities. And this persecution that I've endured has introduced me to the Savior in ways I couldn't have known otherwise. So, confirming their souls, yes. Exhorting them to continue in the faith despite the winds of opposition that were blowing all around them, yes. Through much tribulation come the blessings. Joseph Smith could bear a similar testimony post-Liberty Jail. And as many saints remarked, he was a different man after that experience. I think we're seeing similar change, maturity, growing up in God, uh, a stiffening of the spine, uh, stealing of the nerves, and I single to the glory of God, come what may. That's coming to Paul here. But it is time to leave, having confirmed them. Notice what he does in verse 23 through 25. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. And after they had passed throughout Pisidia, it's an inland region where Antioch was, they came to Pamphylia, that's the region south of Pisidia on the coast. And when they had preached the word in Perga, that's that coastal city where they'd first landed, they went down into Atalia which is another coastal city just to the west of Perga. You see what they're doing place by place? They're coming in, making a difference, and then making sure the difference remains. It's not in one door and out the other. It's not pop in and, and bear a few good tidings and then leave people. It's make sure the church can continue in their absence. This idea of a lay ministry this idea of planting the kingdom, but then putting farmers in place to care for the, the striplings, these little plants. Newly called shepherds to shepherd the flock. They're ordaining elders. They're praying and fasting. They're commending them to God on whom they believe. That's another great phrase. You didn't convert because you believe in me. Because if you did, then now that I have to leave, you'd probably leave shortly thereafter. Leave the faith, at least. But I'm obsolete now. It's a beautiful thing to be as a missionary, or as a teacher, or as a parent. Not obsolete to the point that they don't want you anymore, but they don't need you anymore the way they used to. Like the lame man who couldn't stand on his own two feet. Not only he can, now everyone can. And with their own elders among them, you believe in God, He's still here. The source of your conversion is still going to be the source of your continuation. So stay strong in Him. Then the chapter ends, verse 26 through 28. Thence they sailed to Antioch. They're coming back home, finishing this mission. From whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. So beautiful. The apostles were recommending the people to God, and the people had been recommending the apostles to God as well. How's that for synergy? We're all here in this together. And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them, and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. And there they abode long time with the disciples. How I would have loved to join them in that meeting. To hear their words. This sounds a lot like fast and testimony meeting, to be honest. At least the best kind. The church gathering together, rehearsing all that God had done with them. This is how I've seen God's hand in my life. This is how he is opening the door of faith unto all the people around me. Oh, if that's not going to help you continue firm in the faith, I don't know what will. This is powerful. Now, Paul's first mission has come to its close. Amazing things have happened. People being healed and cursed, depending on how they responded. People's eyes opening and other eyes being shut. People coming down on the side of either Jews or apostles. The choice is theirs. But Paul preaching the message and 
and turning the keys of the kingdom in a Gentile direction. Now that is going to be huge for the subsequent history of the Christian church. But right then, in that moment, boots on the ground, what exactly does that mean? I'm glad that we're opening the door to the Gentiles, but are we closing the door to the Jews? It doesn't seem like it. We keep preaching to them first in each new city. But if Judaism was the foundation of Christianity, as Gentiles come in, do they have to pass through Judaism on the way? There was, a, there was a group of people called the Judaizers, and that was their contention. Their belief was, yes, you can't be a Christian without being a Jew first. And so if Gentiles want to come in, that's fine, but they've got to be circumcised like we did. We, they've got to live the law of Moses like we do. They, they've got to be Jewish Christians, even if they end up being Gentile Jewish Christians. Okay? Now, that is going to be a, a, a struggle to decide, are the Judaizers correct? Or was Peter correct to just baptize Cornelius without any kind of circumcision first? Uh, is Paul doing right, or is he jumping the gun in turning things to the Gentiles without having them pass through Judaism? This is where Acts chapter 15 is, is really, really important. Acts chapter 15 is the story of what they call the Jerusalem Conference. And in this Jerusalem Conference, you are seeing, well, you're seeing the right way to decide things. I actually remember when I was, uh, it was my first year of divinity school, and I was taking a class on early Christian history. And it went from New Testament times till right before the Reformation. And in this class, it was taught by a, an old Jesuit priest, amazing guy. He knew his stuff inside and out. And I remember us talking about these ecumenical councils in later Christian history, post-New Testament Christian history, where you get the Council of Nicaea, that's really famous. We all know about that Nicene Creed. Well, we studied the Council of Chalcedon and the Councils of Constantinople. There was a council in Ephesus. And it kept going through as, the, as this, well, empire-wide religion was trying to hammer out orthodoxy and decide what do we all agree to believe. What amazed me, though, was how much contention and conflict reigned in so many of those councils. How much disagreement and disputation there was to the point of schisms forming and schismatic groups being labeled heretical by the majority and splitting off to form new churches and major problems uh, in the aftermath of each of these councils. And some of the, even during the council, there is physical intimidation and yikes. Uh, I kept thinking as I was studying this, I wish we could just follow the model of Acts chapter 15. The Jerusalem conference is the way things ought to go. And to see how decisions are made among the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve in our day, it's a lot closer to Acts 15 than it is to the Council of Ephesus, Ephesus or Chalcedon. Let's look at the details here, okay? Successful mission accomplished. Still got challenges ahead. We've got decisions to make, uh, wrinkles to iron out. Where do we go from here? How do we organize and structure this Gentile influx into the, the kingdom of God? Well, verse 1, certain men which came down from Judea, and if they're from Judea, picture these as homegrown Jews. Well, they come, they taught the brethren, and said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Now, that's textbook Judaizer for you. Defending circumcision as the token of the Abrahamic covenant. You gotta, don't mess with Moses, stick with his law, keep his commandments. That's what makes a Jew. And a good Jew is what makes a good Christian. Okay? Now, when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, and you can see why they would be disputing, they're standing there going, whoa, 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 wait a minute, what about those outside of Abraham? What about the Gentiles? Are you really going to require circumcision of them? And the Judaizers are like, you better believe we are. And Paul and Barnabas are like, over our dead body. It's like, and our bodies almost were dead as we were preaching this among Jews that wouldn't let Gentiles come in. Well, all that dissension, all that disputation, what are they going to do about it? 
they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. Now, I don't care much for the dissension and disputation, but that final decision was an inspired one. Why don't we all just pause our protests, end our contention, and, and go to apostles of God? It's that apostolic advantage I talked about at the beginning of the book of Acts. Men authorized of God, inspired by God, receiving institutional revelation for the church. Let's see what they have to say about this matter. Like I said, President Nelson just talked about the need to overcome disputation and end contention. This is starting poorly, but they're moving in a better direction already, two verses in. Now the third verse in. Being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phenis and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles. And they caused great joy unto all the brethren. Here they are preaching along the way as usual. They're not just taking the quickest route to get to the next assignment. No, we're going to spread seeds every step of the way. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders. And they declared all things that God had done with them. Notice, this is less about making a point or winning an argument and more about letting God make manifest His will. This reminds me of where we started this week, with Peter having a vision, Cornelius having a vision, each having pieces of the puzzle, but sharing that piece with one another so that they could come to a fuller understanding. Here, Paul and Barnabas come and simply say, this is what we've seen. This is how we have seen God act among the Gentiles. Again, Peter had said that back in chapter 11, right? As he's trying to share the experiences he, that he's had with Cornelius and his band. We saw the Spirit of God shed forth upon them, just like it had been shed forth on us. God seems to treat us all equally with no respect of persons. It's a whole new day. Paul and Barnabas saying, likewise, but letting God reveal his will. Verse 5, but there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed. So yes, at least they're believers. These are Christian Pharisees. But if they were Pharisees at all, that's a deeply conservative Jewish past. Every jot and tittle, right? The ones always making Jesus an offender for a word. Well, it's going to be easy to make Paul and Barnabas offenders here. And so what's their decision? What's their plan? They said that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Well, the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. This is a major decision. We can't minimize this. How much of Judaism is essential to Christianity and how much of Judaism is incidental to Christianity? You understand the difference? The essential things, that's what, not only what made Judaism Judaism, it's what makes Christianity Christian. It's those parts that must continue. It's those things that Jesus said, I'm not here to destroy the law. I'm here to fulfill it. But what, what did he mean by that? What parts of the law are permanent, essential, unchanging? In fact, what is the law of Moses that you speak of? You're demanding that people keep it. What exactly do you mean by that, though? Because there's the the moral law, how we should treat one another, that does seem eternal. But there's the ceremonial law, the ritual law, with animal sacrifice. We've already seen that change. First of all, there's, well, give it, a, give it time and there'll be no temple to perform those daily ritual sacrifices. So we're going to have to rethink that <laughs> top to bottom. But even in the meantime, Christ came and the shedding of his blood put an end to the shedding of animals' blood. He wants a broken heart and a contrite spirit. So what does that mean about the continuation of the law? We really are going to have to wrestle with this and decide what's permanent and what's changing. In some ways, we could do the same in our day to question church culture versus church doctrine. 
what are passing programs versus what are eternal principles? And what are just the way we've always done things versus the core doctrine of the church? Elder Uchtdorf once described a fledgling branch in Russia, I think, and said, a new branch president there, should he try to implement every bit of the full program of the church? And he said, heaven forbid. Just start with the basics. Faith and repentance and baptism and the gift of the Holy Ghost. You'll grow from there. But it is wise, especially those that leave the church. I'm often asking them, what, what are you leaving about it? What is the church to you? And so much of what they describe that they're leaving behind is culture. To which I'll say, good riddance. I left that church long ago. But the gospel of Jesus Christ remains my sure foundation. And it's amazing to differentiate between the two. That's something they're going to have to figure out here. Okay? So verse 7 when there had been much disputing, which again is not the right way to go about it, Jesus, when he was among the Nephites, three times condemned their disputation. Even though they're in pursuit of righteous ends, it's unrighteous means to get there. So no, no disputation here. These people are still fighting over it. And in the midst of it all, Peter, chief apostle, rose up and began to speak. He said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. In other words, God has been trying to make this transition for a while now. If Paul's first missionary, missionary journey lasted you know, between two and three years, it's been a while. Cornelius <laughs> has had a good long time in the church by now. And so God has been revealing his will already. He goes on, And God, he could say, not us, which knoweth the hearts. So he's not being fooled here. He's not being tricked. If you're not sure of the Gentiles' motives for coming into the kingdom of God, God is not concerned by those things. He's aware of it all. And God bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. And put no difference between us and them purifying their hearts by faith. Now that's a phrase I would expect from Paul, but here it's coming from Peter. The Lord is purifying their hearts by faith. It's faith that is saving them. Faith in the perfect Christ, not imperfect obedience to the perfect law. You see, if it were saved by our obedience to law, then that Obedience would have to be perfect, and we've all fallen short of that. No wonder we need God to grant repentance to us all. Well, he granted it to the Gentiles. He's granted it to us Jews. It's repentance either way. It's coming unto Christ either way. And if we do so, then no matter what our backgrounds might be, he grants us the gift of the Holy Ghost. I've seen it happen. He came upon us, he came upon them, and I couldn't tell the difference. We were new made men in our day of Pentecost. So were they. Go ask Cornelius. You'll be amazed by him. One of the things I love about this is it's as if Peter is saying, we're not trying to, to, to make the Gentiles more like Jews. Because being Jews was never the ultimate goal. Being true disciples of Jesus Christ was. <laughs> We're not trying to become more Jewish as a church. We're trying to become more Christian. In fact, we're trying to become more Christ-like. That's the ultimate goal here. I think in some ways, if we were to take that in our day, we could say we're not trying to turn non-members into members. We're trying to take both non-members and members and help them all become more like Christ. That's going to come in different, in different speeds and different ways and different directions, but if we can all become more like the Savior, that's a step in the right direction for all of us. I've even been wrestling this with this when it comes to LGBTQ matters. 
because I think too often we think that the goal is to take homosexuals and help them become more like heterosexuals. But that's aiming way too low. In some ways, it allows heterosexuals to feel like, oh, I was born with a get out of jail free card because I'll never succumb to that sin. Well, that doesn't mean you'll never succumb to sexual sin. You've got plenty of your own to, to deal with. And so the goal here, the solution is not heterosexuality. The solution is to become more like the Savior. And both, and that's what the law of chastity is for, among so many other laws, so many other commandments and covenants beckoning us to come unto Christ and be perfected in Him. There is a lot of perfecting to do among both homosexuals and heterosexuals. We all need to become like Jesus. And that seems to be the point that Peter is getting at. His focus is on faith, after all. Faith in Christ, to come unto Christ, and to be perfected in Christ. We all have work to do to, to move in that direction. So Peter goes on and says in verse 10, Now therefore, why tempt ye God? to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. Now, that's a huge admission on his part. That we, could, we didn't live the law of Moses perfectly. Our fathers certainly didn't. Remember those manners that God had to deal with, as Paul had taught earlier? No, we failed miserably, which is why Christ had to come to redeem us. And if we failed miserably at living that law, why would we force that law upon others that don't have the background to live into it? Weren't raised with that kind of expectation. No, don't force that yoke upon them. In fact, replace it with a different kind of yoke. Remember what the Lord said about his yoke? It was easy. His burden was light. That's what Peter says in the next sentence. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. It's not that they're getting the get-out-of-jail-free card, and, oh, well, they're going to be saved by grace, but we all had to be saved by works, and we had to live the gospel, and we had to keep the commandments and all the mosaic issues. And, man, that's kind of grumbling that, like, what, converts got the easy route? No. We've been blessed with the oracles of God our whole lives. We've known the plan and had the prophets, and, and yet even we will only be saved by faith in the grace of God. That's why Jesus came, to point us to that higher, nobler, better, truer way. That's why his yoke was easy. He wasn't giving us get out of jail free. He was simply changing out a yoke we couldn't handle, one we chafed under, and giving us a new yoke. We're still in one, but Christ is our yoke partner. We've transferred our allegiance to Him. He's taken our sins upon Him. He still had to pay for them. But now that we've become His, He can continue to work on us and in us and through us and with us at His pace and fill the guilt gap, which we've talked about repeatedly. Perfect law, imperfect us. Fill that gap with guilt. And there's nothing we can do about it. You, what, you're going to impose that same standard of perfection upon the Gentiles, whose lives will fall short of them just like ours have? No, Jesus isn't lowering the, uh, lowering the standard, believe me, but he's filling the guilt gap with grace. And it's that grace that saves us. It's that same grace that saves them. So the real question is, how do we tap into that grace? How do we come into Christ? Is it through circumcision or is it through baptism? Is, it, is the circumcision of the heart what we're after? Is that the change we need to make? These are powerful questions that Peter is is raising, and powerful points that he's making. In verse 12, then all the multitude kept silence. Oh, he'd shut them up all right. They had nothing to say. It's, they're sitting back 
wondering about what he's saying here. You know, he's right. Have they been condemned by their own conscience? Have they been pricked in their hearts? Do they realize that it's only by the grace of God that even they can be saved? Well, as they keep silence, they then give audience to Barnabas and Paul, who declare what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And again, it's the miracles that God has wrought, not what they had done. These additional witnesses have come to the stand to do as Peter had done, not to force their will upon the jury, but simply to bear witness of what they've seen God do during their ministries. Now, after their witness, verse 13, we see a new figure come to the witness stand. After they had held their peace, James answered. And yes, this is James, the brother of Jesus. James, who seems to lead the church there in Jerusalem. James, just a wonderful, wonderful soul who has changed so much in the course of his life. Who understands his brother now in ways he never had during his half-brother's life. James answers, and notice what he says. Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon... And it's so interesting that he's talking about Peter here, but he calls him Simeon. He's reminding him and everyone else of Peter's humble roots, and in fact, of Peter's Jewish roots. Peter's name was Simon, but he, James doesn't even call him Simon. He calls him Simeon, as in one of the 12, 12 tribes of Israel. That's where Simon's name comes from. So let's go all the way back to the beginning. Let's tap into our Jewish roots, shall we? Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles. It wasn't Peter's visit. It wasn't Paul's visit. It was God's visit. He came. And what did he come to do? To take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written. And then he's going to quote some scripture. That's one of James's gifts. He knows the word of God. Peter does too. Paul does too. But James is going to start quoting it here at the Jerusalem conference. What's interesting is it reminds me of Sidney Rigdon when he was called to not only be a scribe for Joseph Smith, but to be a spokesman for Joseph, in a manner of speaking. You see, Sidney had been a, a minister, a preacher. He knew the Bible inside and out. And so how's this for his assignment? DNC 35 verse 23. Thou shalt preach my gospel and call on the holy prophets to prove his words. Joseph's, that is, as they shall be given him. Prove his words? You know, it's search the prophets and call upon them to give Joseph biblical backup. He's not making up new doctrine. It's all couched in scripture. He just doesn't always know what the scripture was. He's getting it straight. He's eliminated the middleman. He's getting revelation straight from heaven as the ancient prophets did. But since people are so tied to their biblical belief, if you could provide those middlemen and call them to the witness stand to defend what Joseph is revealing, oh, that would be helpful, Sidney. And Sidney was more than willing and more than able to do just that. James, same thing here. So he's going to call on prophets, okay, to, to give agreement to what Peter has just said. So first one he calls upon is Amos, chapter 9, verse 11 and 12. And here he quotes it in verse 16 and 17. After this, I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. And I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. That's the gathering of Israel that Amos is prophesying. But it's not just Israel. So next verse, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord. The Gentiles, upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. That's the prophecy in Amos 9. Now, the interesting thing there is in Amos's original version, yes, it speaks about the raising up the tabernacle of David. That's the restoration of the house of Israel. But then the second verse that James quotes, he quoted a little bit differently. Here's the Amos original. That they may possess the remnant of Edom... And of all the heathen, which are called by my name, saith the Lord that doeth this. 
Now, if you were to put James's version and Amos's original side by side, you'd see the, the parallels. You'd see the commonalities. Uh, Amos of the heathen. James talks about the Gentiles. Oh, potato, potato. But the interesting thing is when he talks about the Edomites, for example, and that's another example of outsiders, the way Amos puts it, the Israelites gather themselves, they'll restore the kingdom of David, and they'll possess the remnant of Edom. They'll possess the country of the heathen. It's like they're taking over the enemy territory. It's militaristic, nationalistic, oh, go fight, win. James's version is so much softer. In James' version, it's not some kind of conquest. It's more an extension of the arms of safety, of the wings of the mother hen. It's bringing them in. Now, either way, the two are becoming one. But again, the softness of James, it's not conquest, it's invitation. It's covenant on the part of the Gentiles that are choosing to enter because those Gentiles have called upon God's name. They want to be his people. In fact, the way both versions end, it is the Lord that doeth this. That's important to keep in mind no matter which version you follow. God's people, the borders are being extended. Again, lengthened cords and strengthened stakes. That's what we're after. And it's not just about conquering foreign powers. It's about inviting them to come into the banquet feast. All are invited. All are alike unto God. Then in verse 18, James continues this sermon. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. So God knows what he's been doing from the very start. And is this all just part of his grand plan? Wherefore my sentence is, and this is James giving his best advice, that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. Let's not trouble them. Let's not add a yoke like Brother Simeon, <laughs> Simon, Peter was talking about. Let's not trouble them. We're not trying to keep people out by raising the bar to some point that it's unclearable for them. No, let's not do that. But... At the same time, we're not trying to scare off the Jews, since the Jews were God's original covenant people. That's why I'm talking about Simeon here. So how about this by way of compromise? But that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols, and from fornication, and from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. I mean, Judaism's not going away anytime soon, okay? It's God's covenant people. It'll never go away entirely. And so, every city, every Sabbath, the Jews are out there reading Moses, preaching the law. And if we, have hope to, if we hope to have any success among our fellow Israelites, we can't just pay lip service to the law of Moses. It came from God. So let's be as discerning as we can and determine what are the essential elements of the Law of Moses that, are, that continue in the Gospel of Christ. For example, the moral law, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill. Let's make sure we, with, that we restrain ourselves from fornication from blood. Even some of the kosher laws, the, the strangling of animals and the blood that, uh, no, let's, let's not eat that. And pollutions of idols, all of idolatry. In some ways, this, this is Roman ritual practice. And among the Roman religion, there's going to be a lot of idolatry. And there's going to be a lot of Oh, ritual immorality, and we've got to steer clear of that. We have to be different in the world, but not of it. And so, circumcision, no, the Abrahamic covenant will hold firm, but the token for entrance can be baptism as well as circumcision. 
really, even in circumcision, it was the circumcision of the heart that God was after. You just can't perform that surgery. That's something internal that we all need to work on. And it's the grace of God that, that accomplishes it for them as well as for us. So how's that for a compromise? We will honor those things from Judaism that would probably be most offensive to Jews. We're not trying to flaunt our freedom in their face. No, his freedom is still structure. It's still discipline. That's what discipleship is. And so, no, we will maintain our discipline in these areas. How does that sound? Well, we're about to see. Will this compromise be acceptable to both sides of the issue? Uh, I, I love Venn diagrams, where you have these circles that overlap. They suggest a part of the overlap is the place of, of shared belief. It's a place where compromise comes easiest because we both share these values. When I've done interfaith work, as I train groups to be able to begin participating, I'll usually draw a Venn diagram on the board and say, if this side of the Latter-day Saints and this side of the evangelicals, in your conversation with one another, try to get a sense of how much overlap you have, uh, what things you share and what things you, you don't share. Okay, But that's only the first step. A second step here is to determine your center of gravity and where on your Venn diagram are the things that matter most to you. Because you might have two people that are very different and only have a tiny sliver of overlap. But if within that sliver lie the things that matter most to them, then that's a match made in heaven. This applies to marriage and not just to interfaith work, by the way. On the other hand, you could have two people or two groups that almost completely overlap. They share so much. But if the things that matter most to them, the essentials rather than the incidentals of their identity, if those lie in the slivers on the edge where they don't see eye to eye, then that's cause for conflict, even though they have so much in common. They just agree on things that don't really matter that much to either one. So in this compromise that James is suggesting, what's going to matter most to the Gentiles? Can they still come in to lay hold of the gospel of Christ? Without the yoke becoming so burdensome as to be unbearable. Meanwhile, to the Jews and the Judaizers, is there, are we showing sufficient loyalty to our Abrahamic past? to our Israelite roots, to Moses. After all, if Jesus was one like unto Moses, then far be it from Jesus to contradict Moses completely. Again, fulfill, not destroy. Are we fulfilling okay? If you ever have to compromise, and that's all of us all the time, then I would suggest that you not only find out what you feel and what the other person feels, but try to find out how deeply both parties feel about it. It's not just, I want that and you want that, but how badly do we want those things? Give yourself a score. And if you say, I'd rather do this, but I'm maybe a four, and you'd rather do that, and you're like an eight, well, let's, let's lean in your direction then. And how do we make it amenable to my side, but we're definitely going to go in yours because it matters so much. Well, how are they going to compromise here? Look at verse 22. Then pleased it the apostles and elders, that's the leadership, with the whole church, that's the laity, you get a sense of common consent there, it pleased them all, to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. So we still don't know what the plan is, but we're going to gather some people, add some additional companions to Barnabas and Paul, and then send them back to Antioch. And not only are they going to go with the news in mind, they're actually going to go with the news in hand. And they wrote letters by them after this manner. And this is what they wrote. The apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Asia. You see, we're going to have to get the word out. We're going to send people. We're going to send letters until everyone knows. 
We've got to make sure the water gets to the end of the row, and it's living water we're trying to extend. So let's write it. That will give them something to look at, vis visual. It's written so they can study it. They can keep it. It's permanent. But we'll also have the people there, these living messengers, because that way they can have conversation and dialogue and try to come to an understanding of things. It's, there's a difference between textual and oral, and, and both are really important. Okay, one can't do what the other does and vice versa. So we're going to send messengers and we're going to send a message. And the message will be to our brethren, the Gentiles. Now that tells you already that they're trying to embrace them as equals. These are our brethren. Verse 24, the message continues. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls... Other translations say, upsetting your minds. Either way, you've been troubled, saying, ye must be circumcised and keep the law. I mean, I know that's the word that's gone out, and these Judaizers have been vocal, and now you're scared to death, thinking, wait, that? We have to live the entire thing? We, we have to fully embrace Judaism on the way to Christianity? Well, this letter is going to clarify it. To whom we gave no such commandment. That is not what we decided. And this is coming from the living oracles. This is coming from Peter. It's coming from James. It's coming from Barnabas and Paul and now Silas and Barsabas. And the leaders of the church in Jerusalem are making sure that everyone knows the decision that's been made. And here's how he made it. I love this phrase. It seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord. There's that unity to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, how for serious credentials. <laughs> These apostles will have legitimate street cred among that are being persecuted out on the outskirts as well. These men have been stoned for the word's sake. They would not back down. They believe to the point of of laying their lives on the altar. And so please trust what they say when they come. And their message is one of acceptance. You, you can trust these emissaries, these messengers. There's a great verse in Doctrine and Covenants 42 that I always go back to when somebody claims to have some kind of divine authority when they don't. And these would-be prophets that sometimes start up schismatic movements and try to draw away from among the most faithful among us. This verse of Doctrine and Covenants 42, verse 11. Again, I say unto you that it shall not be given to anyone to go forth to preach my gospel or to build up my church, except he be ordained by someone who has authority. And it is known to the church that he has authority and has been regularly ordained by the heads of the church. And that should lay to rest the lack of credentials of those would-be prophets. Well, Barnabas and Paul have those credentials. They have the scars to prove it, but also the ordination behind them. So verse 27, We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, new companions to the, the two that you've come to know and love, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. So like I said, additional witnesses, written so you can study it, oral so you can discuss it and ask questions. And then my favorite phrase from the whole Jerusalem conference, for it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. And then they list them that ye abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication. From which, if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well. Fare ye well. And that's it. Keep it simple. Focus on the absolutely necessary things, the things that do the most good at helping us do well. And then fare thee well. I know you can handle this. Does this seem good to you? Because it seemed good to us. And most important of all, it seemed good to the Holy Ghost. The way they phrase that is so powerful. It's so real.
It's such a, in some ways, an understated description of Revelation, but as real a description of it as I've seen anywhere in Scripture. Too often we just picture, oh, the booming voice of God, and He comes down and descends and speaks face to face. He does that. He did it with Moses. Jesus Himself did it among the apostles several times, including right before He ascended to heaven once and for all. If Jesus wanted to come and clarify things, he could have. He could have appeared behind closed doors there in the Jerusalem conference. Who cares about what Peter says, or James, or Paul, or Barnabas, or anybody else? Christ is the head of the church, and he comes and descends among them and says, this is how it's going to be. Jews, fall into line. Gentiles, fall into line. This is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes into the Father but by me. So there you have it. But he doesn't. When he delegates, he means the delegation. He's wanting us to grow up in him and come to an understanding of balance between agency and inspiration. He wants us to do our homework, like he said to, to Oliver Cowdery in the Doctrine and Covenants. What, you took no thought save it was to ask me? Come on, you're supposed to study these things out. Go send for Paul and Barnabas. Get their word on things. Get Peter to come and describe the experiences he's had with God. Get everyone to come in and provide their piece of the puzzle, this scattered revelation. Have James, just a great peacemaker himself, come and suggest his best thinking on what kinds of compromises might be satisfactory to both parties. And then think about it, and ponder, and pray, and decide what seems good unto you and to the Holy Ghost. Like I said, that is so understated. It seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us. It seemed? That doesn't fill me with confidence. Well, it does prompt me to exercise faith. It does put the ball in my court to decide, well, I have access to that same Holy Ghost. And if I'm in tune with that same Spirit, and if it seemed good to the Spirit, and those who have paid an incredible price to be in tune with it, then I'll receive similar confirmation. I'll be able to know for myself. At least it'll seem good to me. There's, there's something about this... I, I don't know. I, I, I love it. I love the phrase... It, it's inspiring to me in its raw reality. I've heard Elder Irene talk about how decisions are made among the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve. We've heard President Nelson talk about that and the need for unanimity. It's that unanimity that will offset fallibility, as I often tell my students. It's them wrestling with, with the Lord trying to understand His will, and everyone giving their very best efforts at explaining their own experience, their own perceptions, and the kinds of puzzle pieces that have fallen to them. To th for them to collectively to come and to wrestle and to ask and to do more homework and to offer more prayers and take more time. It's often a slow process. But for them to come to a unity of the faith until it seems good to them and to the Holy Ghost. I don't know a group of people with a higher caliber of conversation partners. Or a deeper degree of consecration to live their lives in such a way that they can be in tune with the Holy Ghost. I do sustain our living prophets and apostles with all my heart. I'm grateful for the price they pay to receive revelation. And whenever they have revealed it to me, it has seemed good. It has been necessary things that have helped me do well. Verse 30, So when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch. And when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the epistle, which when they had read, they rejoiced for the consolation. Interesting word there. Other translations, for the exhortation, for the encouragement. The Greek word actually suggests more of the person-to-person -person nature of the message. 
It's actually the same root word as paraclete, which is that word we learned about the Holy Ghost, the word translated as comforter in the King James. So interesting, this rejoicing in that comforting word, that paracletes, that, that comforters have come. The Spirit's confirming, the apostles are coming to, to share this glorious news with us. This is, this is the unity of the faith that we're stepping into. And we're coming to know the Lord's will this way. And Judas and Silas, these junior companions, being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. That's why it wasn't enough just to have the message. They needed the messengers. There's something powerful about a personal visit that just leaves you feeling comforted, consoled, confirmed in the faith. When President Howard W. Hunter came to the MTC when I was a missionary there, having just became president of the church himself, and me, I loved President Benson. He was my prophet growing up. And President Hunter, I didn't really know. But I knew him after that one visit, because the power of God, the Spirit of God, the paraclete himself, came to confirm to me that I was in the presence of a true prophet. That's happened to me repeatedly as I have been in the presence of other prophets, seers, and revelators. There's something about being with them. My brother-in-law told me an ex experience, what he had when he was Elder Scorn president in Boston. And Elder Holland came to Boston to speak to the young single adults. As Elders Quorum President, my brother-in-law just wanted every one of his elders to come and be in the presence of a prophet. And particularly one young man who had been inactive for a long time. He just pled and persuaded and eventually prevailed. And the young man came. After an amazing fireside, the young adults just lined the walls of the chapel in hopes that Elder Holland would come by and shake hands and... You're not going to be able to stop Elder Holland from doing that. The way my brother-in-law described the experience, Elder Holland came and just showed personal attention to person after person after person, one by one by one. When it came to him, he was more interest, my brother-in-law was more interested in making sure his friend got to meet Elder Holland and introduced him and told him a little bit of his background. And Elder Holland, by the end of his brief conversation with this struggling soul, Elder Holland was holding his face in his hands and expressing God's love for this wandering soul. My brother-in-law said it was one of the most beautiful things he'd ever seen. You want to talk about comfort. You want to talk about consolation. Paul can do that. Barnabas can do that. Silas can do that. All of these men called of God prophets in their own right, confirming the truth of the message that they've brought. After which, verse 33, after they had tarried there a space, they were let go in peace from the brethren unto the apostles. I mean, we can't get too greedy with their time after all. <laughs> There's more missions to pursue and perform. Now, notwithstanding, it pleased Silas to abide there still. So he's going to stick around and they'll be able to rejoice in his presence. Paul, meanwhile, also, and Barnabas, continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. And th thus again, we see the significance of Antioch in the initial history of the Christian church. Now, verse 36, some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, Oh, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord. Oh, even the ones where we almost got stoned to death, huh? What do you say? Let's go back to Antioch and Iconium, shall we? Let's go back to Perga and wander around through the island of Cyprus. Let's go revisit our old converts and see how they do. That's <laughs> such a great phrase. In missionary lingo, this would be following up. This is checking up on your converts. This is continuing to strengthen the flock. But I love the way Paul said it. Let's just go see how they do, huh? I have full faith that they've continued in the faith. But to just go and just renew those relationships, shall we? Now, Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. 
Again, that's what I brought up earlier when Mark first departed. It did cause some friction, a bad taste in the mouth of Paul, and he, at this point, wasn't yet willing to let Mark rejoin him. So they're going to part ways. It's actually a sad moment, in my opinion, especially right on the heels of this moment of glorious unity based on the Jerusalem Conference. We're becoming one, Jews and Gentiles, and we're going to let bygones be bygones and not worry about our pasts. It's our present and our future. It's like, oh, Paul, can't you see that with Mark? His future is glorious. And like I said already, Paul will eventually see that. Mark will prove himself abundantly. And we all will have opportunities to do just that. But for now, you see a little friction, a little division. Oh, there's always a few snakes in Eden. There's always a few cracks in the cement that binds us together in Zion. At least there will be until we all fully build upon Jesus Christ as our chief cornerstone. And that's what they're attempting to do. They've just got a ways to go yet. And then this part of the story ends. Actually, it only ends with a new beginning. Verse 39 through 41, our final words. The contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. And that's tragic. Sharp contention? So bad they had to split up this amazing companionship? Oh, Paul, let it go. It's okay, people can change. You did. You're the poster boy of that. Give Mark another chance. Now, like I said, eventually he will. But for now, they part ways. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed into Cyprus. As far as Barnabas was concerned, no, I've got no problems with Mark at all. He's, I, he probably had reasons to leave. I'm okay with that. And he goes one way. Meanwhile, Paul chose Silas and went another way. They departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. They're all going to need it. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. So this dynamic duo of Barnabas and Paul have now split gained new companions, and then headed off in different directions. Oh, I suppose that the Lord here is oh, still using human weakness to show forth His strength, and dividing missionaries just to let them double their workload and head off in different directions. Oh, eventually they'll all be reconciled, and Paul will have wonderful things to say about Mark. There's, this is just a rough patch. And in some ways, it's nice to know that even prophets and apostles can sometimes fail to see eye to eye. There can be friction there, too. I guess, I guess I'm saying that it's nice to know that you don't have to be perfect to engage in the work of God. And that God will still call you to the work, despite your imperfections. The way that we see it here is just because you're on the Lord's errand doesn't make you perfect, because they weren't. But flip it around, just because you're not perfect, you're not disqualified from the Lord's errand. He just wants to keep working on you and working in you to make you more like Him. We're going to see that happen with Paul and Barnabas and Silas and Mark. And I imagine we'll see it as we look at the person in the mirror. God's gracious hand. That's what they were being commended unto, right? Recommended unto the grace of God. They're going to need it. We all do. What we've studied this week, I hope, has been more than historical. I hope it's been helpful. More than just learning Paul's geography. And more than oh, meeting this new cast of characters. I hope you see yourself among them. More than anything, I hope you see yourself within the all-encompassing embrace of God. That you are someone He values and someone He wants to bring home to Him. Whether Jew or Gentile, male or female, high or low, rich or poor, all are alike unto God. If nothing else, may we internalize that after this week's study. May we look beyond our borders and see brothers and sisters, not others and enemies. 
may we gain fraternal regard to match God's paternal regard. May we embrace the fact that God is no respecter of persons and that all are alike unto him. I am grateful for a God of love, a God of perfect inclusion, a God, a God with standards, but one who fills us with grace so that we might someday reach that standard. I pray that we can offer one another the grace of God as well, because we're going to need it as we strive to become more like Christ in all that we do.